And welcome to the Women on the Wall radio show. We are excited to be with you here today at our live studio in Arlington, Texas. And that's the WBTM studio, which stands for We Become the Media. Because what we know and what we've talked about so many times on this show is that it really is our challenge to become the media because we know that the the mainstream media is not going to cover the stories that need to be covered the stories that have real impact on our children and our grandchildren and future generations of americans uh, future and so we have become the media and we are so excited that uh there, there's some great people in Arlington that have come together and uh, started the WBTM radio studio. So we're going to go ahead and get started today. You know, we've been talking about this event that we're hosting, Women on the Wall is hosting in Austin, Texas, and it's going to be this Friday and Saturday, and it's going to be at the Marriott Courtyard at the convention center right across the street from the convention center and why are we going to be across the street from the convention center because the national pta association is having their national convention at the convention center in austin texas and their keynote speaker is none other than secretary of education arnie duncan who is along with the pta national organization cheerleaders of the common core and why that's a problem well in texas we passed a law hb 462 that says no to the common core uh, we had a ruling yesterday that came out from attorney general greg abbott that said no to the common core but yet if you look at the sessions and the workshops uh, at this convention, it's all about implementing the Common Core at the local level and basically training moms and dads that it's okay for your children to be taught using the Common Core standards. The other real concern is the, the indoctrination, in my opinion, of training moms and dads that it's okay for their personal for their children's personal data and their teachers to be taken without parental consent in the name of education research. This is a real issue for me as a mom of three children. And so Rebecca and I decided that we're not going to stand for this and we're going to have a counter convention across the street. And we have some of the uh, most profound and leading experts against the Common T Core who are going to be in Austin with us. We'll have Dr. James Milgram and Dr. Sandra Stotsky who are on the validation committee for the Common Core National Standards and would not validate them. They said they were not good standards, especially in English language arts and math. We'll have Jane Robbins with the American Principles Project, Dr. Peg Luxick um, from Founded on Truth. We've got a whole host of workshops scheduled. We've got Jenny White coming in from Oklahoma, who's an amazing mom that that led the charge with three other moms to stop the Common Core in the state of Oklahoma. And she's going to be with us in Austin. Now, um, there's some other experts that uh, we wanted to bring in and couldn't because of schedule conflicts. So we have a unique opportunity to have with us today on the radio show Dr. Terrence Moore from Hillsdale College who has written a book called The Story Killer, Common Sense Approach Against the Common Core. And so Terrence Moore has been out speaking across the country, explaining clearly the danger of the Common Core and how it's affecting our great literature. 
and that our children are not learning it. And so I'm going to, instead of reading a whole bio here, I want to introduce to our audience Dr. Terrence Moore and give you just a moment to uh, let folks know who you are, uh, what you've done, and actually what you're, what you're doing in the future. Are you there, Terrence? I am. Well, sure. Thank you for having me on the program, and I, I wish I could be down there with you all in uh, Austin, but unfortunately I'm up here training teachers up at uh, Hillsdale College, including some of the teachers who, uh, who are going to be teaching near Austin this year. Uh, but I, I grew up probably about 20, 25 miles east of where y'all are right now. I grew up in Garland. And uh, I went to different universities, University of Chicago, University of Edinburgh. I was in the Marine Corps for a time. Uh, but for about the past 15 years, I've been engaged in school reform at one level or another. I've been the head of a school, a K-12 through charter school out in Colorado called Ridgeview. And for the last six years, I've been in, at Hillsdale College, uh, both as a professor and also helping start up schools that are part of a charter school initiative that we have here. And then this coming fall, I'm actually moving down to Atlanta, where I'm going to run a K-12 through charter school down there called Atlanta Classical. So uh, I'm, I guess you could say I'm pretty much in the fight when it comes to school reform. Uh, even prior to the Common Core, uh, but what got me involved in that issue was not only did I hear about it, uh, but I also had some moms in Indiana uh, who were dreadfully worried about it, and they called me up and uh, convinced me to start giving talks. And the more that I looked into it, the more I saw just what uh, a complete takeover and really the culmination, the knockout blow uh, of progressive education, which has a hundred-year history in this country, that it really is. And so it's a good thing that people are pretty riled up across the country because uh, this thing needs to stop and we need to start asking our, ourselves the question of what really constitutes a good, sound public education. Well, and it's interesting that you've been involved in education reform for many years. One of the things that I think is so important and um, I had the opportunity to first meet you in St. Louis at Donna Hearn's um, conference but and I don't know if you were there the first night but one of the things that Emmett McGordy with the American Principles Project pointed out and I think this is so important is that he said Republicans have been negligent on the issue of education because all they've been talking about is uh, school choice without talking about what's actually being taught in these schools. And so I've been accused of being against school choice, and actually I'm not. I'm for school choice. I'm for a parent's right to choose what is the best educational opportunity for their child, and it can be different for different children, based on what's in their local community, what's, what the options are for me in my little town of Argyle, Texas, may be different from what's in the middle inner city of Houston or, you know, the, a small town in Alpine, Texas, in West Texas. Those, what school choice looks like is different, but I'm for a, a parent's uh, right to choose whatever's best for their child. But what scares me is that by not acknowledging this issue of common core, the choice has become no choice because of the strategies and the tactics of these people, like David Coleman, who are aligning the SAT, the ACT, and the GED with, with these common core standards. A lot of private schools um, are, are using these same standards. So, I applaud you as someone who is in the education reform movement for exposing the truth because I think it actually harms the school choice in, in education reform. Do you gr agree with that? Well, the Common Core comes at exactly the wrong time. Uh, from their mm -hmm. perspective, it probably comes at the right time. But what we've been seeing over about the past two decades in education is a, a small but growing revolution in in school reform and we see it in homeschooling we see it in charter schools we see it in startup private schools we see it in just a, a whole bunch of different realms and the thing that we're 
we're learning is that the ways that our grandparents were taught actually worked. <laughs> and you don't have to be full full bore classical in the way that, that I am, but nonetheless, if you have any kind of back to basic school and you teach grammar, if you teach math in the way that it used to be taught, uh, if you teach complete works of literature, then you have students who are learning. That's all there is to it. And this is being discovered or rediscovered across the country right now. And the schools that are really doing very well uh, in, in standardized test scores, even when those schools don't teach to the test, are the schools that most heartily embrace, embrace the classics and the traditional ways of learning. And so what happens at this very time is that uh, that's when the Common Core comes out, which what it's really doing is trying to get us away from uh, the, the standard traditional ways of learning. So if you take English, for example, what they're, what they're trying to do is they're, they're trying to replace what they call literary texts, which in the old days we called great literature or great books, and they're replacing them with so-called informational texts. And they're doing so at an astonishing rate, such that if you're a senior in high school, you only read supposedly 30% uh, of, of literary texts and 70% of informational texts. What that means is they're ripping the great literature out of the high schools, even in the English classes. And what do you read in place of the great texts? Well, you read um, articles on Obamacare, you might read articles on how you're supposed to sign up for signed government forms because it, uh, it protects your safety. Uh, you might read a whole host of things that have nothing to do with the classics that are forgettable, that often represent just the latest political propaganda, and that in fact bore children and, and do anything but prepare them for a world in which they're going to have to think about complex problems. And this is, this is not an option. You don't get to say, well, yeah, we think we'll go for this type of education. This is the way that the tests are being written. And it's, it's all astonishingly bad, and it will bore the children uh, until they, they grow to hate school if they don't already. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it will keep students from reading the great things, which would actually constitute real school reform. Well, and I want to talk a little bit about... Um, in, in your video um, that I was watching earlier, you talked about it, when you started diving into uh, these standards, um, the mischief that you, I, I think is the word that you used um, behind these standards and what's actually being taught is not, you know, uh, for instance, um, a, a standard, or as we call them in Texas, the TEKS, the standard might cover the, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. But when you actually look at the lessons or the instructional materials that are given, the teacher manuals that are given to these teachers, they have nothing to do with the real story behind our founders and the Constitution. Um, Sure, let me give you a couple of examples of that Great. if I could. Yes, please do. So here's a book, and I was actually given this by some teachers who had come across it. And it's a, uh, remember, everything that's going on in the English classes is, is, is um, a, 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 an embracing of so-called um, informational texts or nonfiction is the other word. So here is a, a book that's published that is supposed to accompany the Common Core so that you understand exactly how to teach these nonfiction texts. It's called Reading and Analyzing Nonfiction, Slant, Spin, and Bias. Okay, so supposedly we're going to read nonfiction and try to detect the, the bias that's in nonfiction. Well, guess what their leading example is on the promotional literature in order to sell this, this text? The Declaration of Independence. And so in the Declaration of Independence, where it says, we hold these truths, truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, so on and so forth, here's what it says in the margins of this book. Consider the three world powers at the time, England, France, and Spain. They were all monarchies to one degree or another. There is absolutely no basis for this claim. The claim being that um, the, the laws of nature and nature's God entitle us to choose our form of government. And then it goes on, the, in quote, self-evident truth is a basic logical fallacy. The writer making such a claim either cannot conceive of someone's holding a different view or completely abdicates any responsibility to support the claim. Who is the author? Well, the author is Thomas Jefferson, and this was signed by the Founding Fathers. This is the cornerstone of our freedom in America. 
and it's being treated as a text that has a bias to it, and so our purpose in school is to understand the bias, and therefore not to take the words very seriously, because of course the founders are all a bunch of hypocrites. That's, that's what's going on with the text, and I've, I've shown this in my book um, time and time again about what actually happens when you get into the textbooks and the way that these things are being taught, and it's astonishing, but the more that surfaces, because I've just scratched the surface, the more that surfaces, the more that suggests it's, it's worse than we ever thought. This is nothing in the world but an attempt to capture um, the curriculum in all of the schools, make it a, a uniform curriculum, and to read these books in a certain way. Even if it says in the curriculum that's going to be the Declaration, they're going to take a hatchet to it, and they're going to, they're going to cut it to pieces. Who is this? Who is writing this? Who, who is this that's doing this? Well, okay, so there are a bunch of who's. Some are, most of them are nameless. But the, the mm -hmm. fellow who was behind the Common Core, who I guess would be called the architect, is this fellow whose name is David Coleman, mm -hmm. uh, who's a really smart fellow who went to Yale and then got a Rhodes Scholarship and has never really taught or run a school. But we know what way he slants politically. Um, and then he is now in, in charge of the, um, the College Board, which writes the SAT and which writes all the AP tests, which are going in an awful direction right now. In addition to that, you have a lot of other people who are, who are either extremely modest um, in terms of their intellectual abilities or outright folks who are, who are trying to hijack the curriculum, who are a part of writing the Common Core. And then you have these different organizations called Achieve and so what who are writing the tests, uh, and that has been farmed out to two def different testing agencies. And then you have the people who are really doing the, the grunt work, and that's none other than Pearson Publishers. Mm -hmm. And they know exactly what they're writing for, and they know what the, the market is. And they hire editors, and you can look in the front cover of almost any Pearson textbook, they hire editors who are both career educators and have bureaucratic minds, or people who are, um, in fact, hostile to the founding traditions of this country, and they're to be found in university departments, and, and they're... Um, race, class, gender, sexuality folks in the literature departments who really are hostile to any kind of traditional understanding of, of love, of work, of self-government, of the relations between the sexes, and what have you. And so that's why we're seeing this in these textbooks. Well, and it's interesting because I was at um, South by Southwest in in Austin a couple of months ago, that's the big technology convention, and they have South by Southwest Ed U, and I started going to the different sessions, and um, you mentioned in your video also um, the big push on diversity, and um, when I was going into those different sessions, it's all about teaching using social emotional learning the, the Linda Darling Hammond philosophy I, is from what I understand, um, and, and diversity. It's not teaching reading, writing, and math and giving kids the foundation of basics. Um, it, it's all about the social-emotional learning. Explain what that is and how you see that effect. Of, of these huge conferences where you have teachers going and administrators going to this professional development and, and it's all about the social emotional learning. Right, well, as you just saw with the cutting to pieces of the Declaration of mm -hmm. Independence, the idea of actually appealing to reason <laughs> is not something that these folks are very much for. And in fact, they're, they're not even for studying the facts. Um, the fact of the matter is, what should be going on in an English class, because mind you, these are the English standards we're talking about. We're not even talking about the social studies standards. Those are coming, and they're going to be worse. Um, but what, um, what's going on is they're taking the English class, putting a bunch of these so-called um, informational text in there so that they can uh, undermine the American tradition of self-government under the rule of law, the pursuit of freedom. And it's, it's a fairly clever thing to do because how much do English classes really know about the American, English teachers know about the American political tradition? 
if they know anything, it's the study of English. But the great stories are being taken out of the classes, and therefore the class becomes much more politicized. Mm -hmm. So how can you possibly have a discussion uh, about the founding fathers with people who are not even trained in government? So that's what's going on, and to the extent that you even talk about something that is um, serious in, in literature, they're not doing that either. And so, for example, if you read the, if you read the Common Core Standards, you will find uh, Jane Austen, uh, Pride and Prejudice, mentioned uh, as though it's going to be read. So you think, wow, that's great. Here's, here's a model exemplar text. Our kids are going to be reading Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Well, first of all, the, the thing you have to understand about the, the regime of testing is you never read a book all the way through mm -hmm. because they don't care about books. They just care about so-called critical thinking skills. So if you're lucky, you'll get a whole chapter, at which point you're, you're asked a bunch of silly questions that you have to answer so as to prepare yourself for a standardized test. But even if you do that, there's no guarantee that you're actually going to get the chapter of that book in there when you look at the textbooks. Because in the literature textbook published by Pearson, which is the most popular textbook out there, they do not have Jane Austen, any selection from Jane Austen uh, in terms of her novels. What they have is a letter of Jane Austen written to a niece in which Jane Austen praises this fellow that this niece has fallen in love with and essentially says, this is as good a man as you could ever find. You know, he's, he's tall, he's imposing, he's smart, and all of the, this encomium on this man. And out in the margin of the teacher's edition, what's happening is the students are being coaxed uh, to think that Jane Austen represents her time and shows how desperately needy women were in having to think that their only way to be happy was to be married. And the whole unit itself, because Austen is coupled with Mary Wollstonecraft, who is a kind of proto-feminist of her day, is to turn you away from the idea of marriage and the idea that you could ever find happiness in finding the right man. So that's how Jane Austen is used. And, you know, I think she's probably rolling in her grave because I've read a lot of Jane Austen, and it always ends in happiness uh, and family and, and finding the right man. And, and few of those are out there these days. So that, that maybe would be the best thing that, that students could be reading. But that is not what the Common Core is up to. It's, it's mischievous, it's intentional, and its, its purpose is to destroy traditional ways of understanding the world, and particularly love and self-government, freedom and virtue. Let me ask you another question. One of, you know, Texas, we, we were tough. We said no to the Common Core. But what we see is this Common Core philosophy of education, if you will, flooding into our schools. And um, we even, you know, had the Attorney General who ruled yesterday, or his ruling came out that said, said no to Common Core. But what we're seeing, we passed another bill, House Bill 5, that sets up these different pathways to graduation. That sounds good, because if your child is, you know, vocationally inclined, you're going to go down this pathway. If he's STEM inclined, you're going to go down that pathway. The challenge is, those decisions are made at the end of eighth grade, and what if there's late bloomers? What if there's children that have been taught math using this new common core philosophy, they've been taught wrong, um, and we put them down a pathway, and what we're seeing, the strategy and the tactic, it, it's another way to get that kind of workforce uh, development model in place while saying we're not doing Common Core, but actually building a workforce versus training and educating children who love to learn and, and who are great thinkers, whether you're an auto me mechanic and, and you love to read great literature or you're a mathematician. How do you feel about this kind of workforce model of education? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, for, first of all, um, there are some people who've done some brave things in Texas, and that, that sends out the right message for the rest of the country, and, and that's altogether great. Um, but progressive education has been 
um, encroaching upon the public school systems for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I went to public school in Texas, and I distinctly saw in the 70s and 80s the difference between my older teachers, who were what you might call old school, and who had, you know, themselves gone to school in the 40s and 50s, and who had learned to teach in the late 50s and 60s, but between the way they did things on the one hand and the way the newer teachers did on the other hand, who had been captured by the, the progressive mindset. And it was, it was like night and day. And the unfortunate thing is that not only have most of those teachers already retired, but those who haven't and who are looking at the Common Core right now all across mm -hmm. the country are saying, it's time for me to get out. It's time to retire. And there is essentially no institutional memory in all of the public school systems in, in Texas of, or any place in the country of what, what, what education used to look like. And so let me just try to tell you briefly what it used to look like. And that was, it was not, sure you had shop and things like that, but for the most part, it was a really rigorous education in the basics, in math, in grammar, in literature, and so on. And so I remember when I was a kid, I was probably 14 or so, and I discovered my grandfather's textbooks in, in an old hall closet. And uh, these were his high school textbooks, and, and he went to Austin High School. And I looked through them, and they were great. They had complete stories. Uh, he was reading things like uh, The Mill on the Floss, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, uh, lots of Walter Scott, all the way through, complete novels. And I could see that with his markings all the way through. Not these little snippets of things that is, that's what I had when I was in high school. And, and I, I remember distinctly that both my grandfather and my grandmother were, were educated. They, they knew good grammar, uh, and they could correct grammar when they had heard it misspoken. And they would sometimes get tickled when they heard things were cer certainly not grammatical. And in the case of my f grandfather, he went on to become a medical doctor. But my grandmother, she only went to high school. She, she didn't spend a moment in college. And yet she was one of the smartest women I knew. She, mm -hmm. she could do batting averages in her head. <laughs> if you... If you ask, you know, if, what a ball player's batting average was, and you just gave gave her the number of at-bats and number of hits, she would figure it out in about two seconds and get with, you know, within .10 of, of what the batting average was. So our grandparents coming out of high schools used to have pretty astonishing minds by today's standards, and they knew things. They knew all the presidents. They had memorized poetry, and in some cases they knew dozens, if not hundreds of poems that they had memorized. All that has gone. Mm -hmm. And so what I, what I was saying is when we are seeing something of a, an educational, a quiet educational revolution in this country right now, uh, and there's a school in Louisville, for example, called Founders Classical Academy that we're working mm -hmm. with, that Hillsdale is, um, people across the country are rediscovering classical education and actually what the young mind can do, irrespective of what the job is going to be. Anybody who graduates high school and really knows math and knows English grammar that person's going to decide what he or she wants mm -hmm. to do. And who knows what it'll be? Start their own business, probably, or uh, work for a big company, go into the military, uh, go on to college, get a PhD. It doesn't matter. But if you have a mind that is uh, that knows things as opposed to one that's just been sitting behind a computer or that has been programmed with a lot of dubious mm -hmm. um, political propaganda, then you have somebody who is who is more master of his own destiny and will make opportunities for himself or for herself. And that is not what the Common Core is trying to do. And although Texas as a state has rejected the Common Core, it is too big of a state for the Common Core to stay out of. And so they're taking it to the districts and they're shopping it around. And I guarantee that individual superintendents and individual uh, planners of education, they're all gaga over it and they want to get it into their districts as much as they can. So in Texas, it's going to have to be a district-by-district district fight. And mm -hmm. the, the district, in most of these cases, is not your friend. Well, and, and it's interesting because this, this conference is down in Austin, and in one of the larger districts down in Austin, uh, we're hearing rumors that one district specifically has 35 teachers who are retiring this year and they just got a new superintendent and he in a public uh, 
uh, he made a statement in a local publication saying that his, his new job there was to implement the Common Core. Um, and, and I was told by another curriculum director that the C-scope um, was specifically put in to weed out those veteran teachers. And, and that's, you're right, that's exactly what we're, we're seeing. And um, those of us who our eyes are, are opened and we're, we're connecting the dots, um, it is going to be a battle district by district. I was just at our local school board meeting on Monday night and the big debate was on the purchase of textbooks and that um, they can no longer actually purchase textbooks. The, the books that are available are um, all called consumables. So they're just workbooks. So educating our everyday moms and dads of what this big picture is, but even more importantly, educating school board members who are making the financial decisions of, of what to purchase and what not to purchase, I think, you know, it's going to be those schools that can show that they are clearly um, getting away from uh, the Common Core, even instructional materials, and, and and looking at what schools like your building, and the, the teachers that you're training, the curriculums that you're using, and start implementing that. Um, that's what I think is, and, and that's going to happen only by moms and dads demanding it. Do you agree with that, that that's where the real battle is, to educate moms and dads and get Absolute, them? Absolutely. And let, let me give you just a, the most common sense um, question I think that can be asked that unfortunately nobody is asking uh, but this is something that I ask in my book and that is why are we having such a conversation about textbooks and materials in English classes <laughs> why should there be a textbook in an English class right. in an English class you should be reading long novels and plays so there should be no textbook when it's time to read Shakespeare's The Tempest you hand out a copy of Shakespeare's The Tempest that is cheap and paperback and the student should be able to keep and it becomes a part of their library and you should read the whole thing all the way through. Same for Hamlet. When it's time to read the Iliad, the student should get a copy of the Iliad, the whole thing, and they should read it all the way through. All that textbooks do is they, they, they take little selections of literature and they, they chop it up so that you never read a complete story. You don't know how it really ends or how it even begins. And then it also allows the mischief for having these awful teacher's editions, which program the teachers on how the, the authorities, the educational establishment, wants the students taught. But that's not reading literature. That's not anything mm -hmm. uh, like literature at all. You don't go to movies and watch only a tenth of the movie. Why would you pick up a book and only read a tenth of it? Now, admittedly, you have to have a collection of poetry and short stories, but the Norton anthologies, like most people use in college, they don't have all the whistles and bells in them. They just have the short stories, and they, and they have the, the poems, and you just take that out when it's poetry day. But otherwise, students should have books in their hands that they carry around, and they read those novels. These textbooks are nothing but expensive albatrosses that put a lot of mischief in there, causes the, the teachers artificially to rely on them, and therefore makes it much easier not to teach our students, but to program them in exactly what the Common Core and the folks behind it are after. And make your district explain why they have a, an English textbook as opposed to just having them read novels. And I guarantee you they don't have an answer. <laughs> that's, a, that's exactly right. And I, I think it goes back to that professional development of teachers and administrators and superintendents and school boards who just buy into um, the, the education establishment's narrative. And, and we've got to, you're exactly right, we've got to start asking the questions. And that's really the, um, the idea behind can I see? 
Um, can, we want them to ask three questions. Can I see uh, what you're teaching my child? Can I see how you're teaching my child? I want to see the, the teacher's additions. I want to know what conferences the teachers are going to and the curriculum, develop, uh, curriculum writers are going to. And number three, can I see who's financially benefiting from the curriculum products that my child's teacher is being evaluated on? Um, and, and that's really this, this event this weekend is all about exposing the big picture, looking at the reality on the ground for the next generation, and, and giving the call to action to go in and, and say, can I see? Um, Terrence, I know that we, we, uh, we're about out of time. I want to give you an opportunity. If you were there in Austin in front of all of these moms and dads, what would, what would your call to action be and, and what would your encouragement to them be moving forward? I would say fight for your children's minds and souls and fight for the nation's stories. Because the nation's great stories, the great, the great stories of literature that have been with us uh, for centuries and millennia are what teach young human beings how to be good and to long for noble things. And that's what the folks behind the Common Core are trying to take from us. That's why they're the story killers. And so we need to take back our stories and take back our schools. And if we do that, we can then take back our nation. I think you're right on target. Terrence, thank you so much for being with us today, and we hope that you'll come back on the show after this event, and we can report to you um, what happened, and, um, and we'll just keep working together, moving forward, and thank you, thank you for all the incredible work you're doing and the, the message and the information. And I want to encourage everyone to go, Terrence, I butchered the... the end of the name of the book. Tell us again the name of, the, of your book. It's called The Story Killers, A Common Sense Case Against the Common Core. It's yes. available on Amazon or on Kindle if you have one. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Terrence, and I'll, I'll be in touch. All right. My pleasure. Thanks uh, for having me. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. And with that, we will end the show today. And I just want to, again, say thank you for being with us. We encourage you to take the audio um, and, and the video of this show and share it with your friends and neighbors. People need to understand what's happening to our children and our grandchildren and the future generation of America. Um, we need to stand up and fight. And so we'll continue the battle here at Women on the Wall, and we'll be back next week after the convention and sharing, sharing the great news of what happens down in Austin. Thanks, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.